started here on this uh, topic, we're really going into depth into the safety area for the next few months. And so we're going to look at a hierarchy of systems which we get implements to avoid these accidents which we saw in the previous class. So the previous class was intended to give us an idea of a range of disasters and accidents that have occurred. And we noticed several common themes in all of those cases. We saw people taking shortcuts, companies requiring engineers to still produce products despite the fact that they know that there's deficiencies in the maintenance systems, sorry, uh, in the safety systems. Uh, that they haven't maintained the, the equipment for many years, and these then have led to catastrophic failure. What was interesting in the one case study, the Three Mile Island, is we saw the containment around the nuclear reactor, and that actually was a large contributor to the safety of the system. It caught that disaster and prevented it from going further. So the reactor inside the containment vessel, uh, you'll recall we have this outer containment vessel for the nuclear reactor, and then inside the reactor, uh, this vessel, this containment, we have our nuclear reactor. That nuclear reactor actually ruptured, but the containment vessel around it kept it all contained. There was a hydrogen cloud in the in the dome of that containment vessel, and for the three, four days after the reactor um, meltdown, they let that hydrogen off and dispose of it in a safe manner. So there was a catch system in place there to prevent that disaster from going further. That containment is the fifth level in the safety system. We're going to go right down and look at what's layer one, two, three, four, the containment level five, and the emergency response from fire departments, police, and hospitals, those are sort of level six. So we won't focus our attention on level five, containment at level six, emergency response. We're going to look at the things that we have within our control as engineers to um, change on the process. So we're going to go look at the safety and automation systems down here. Now, what you also noticed in the previous uh, class where we looked at all those disasters is that there wasn't any one factor that caused the problem. It was a contribution of multiple things going wrong and coming together at the same time to lead to that disaster. So when we design these processes, we cannot possibly think of all the combinations. Right? There's no human way that we can enumerate every single possibility that these things going wrong simultaneously. We can never come up with them. As creative as we might be, and as many people as we have in our teams to contribute to that process, we will never be able to figure out every single possible scenario. But what we will do is we will cover most possible scenarios. And that's the best we can do. Right? So we'll then look at a later class. We're going to look at this and quantify it in terms of probabilities. And eventually we get to such a high level of probability that we say, OK, we're conf confident and comfortable that we can operate this unit in a safe manner. But we have to do that, recognize that multiple things will go wrong. Now, when things do go wrong, we take an, an action that's proportional to the, to the event deviation, right? So if your temperature on your vessel is being controlled at 200 degrees Celsius, and it goes up to 205 degrees Celsius, what do we do? Or rather, let's say, what don't we do? One of the things we don't do is we don't go shut the plant down. So, we take, for that small deviation from 200 degrees Celsius to 205 degrees Celsius, we have, we take small actions to correct for that. Right? So what we'll see then in the next, uh, over the next few weeks is that our response is such that we take a, a response that's appropriate to the, to the deviation, and we try to still keep going as much as possible while trading more safety versus production. So it's a constant trade every time we look at these safety systems. Okay, so let's um, take a look at this example. Talk to the person next to you and figure out in that flow sheet what might be wrong. What is unsafe in there? Let's take a look at what the system is before we discuss. So here we've got a stream of, of hydrocarbons coming in. Methane, ethane, butane, and it's going into a heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, we're taking a hot stream from our flow sheet elsewhere. 
and we're taking that hot stream, exchanging heat, and cooling it down. So this fluid, this stream is cooling down. We're heating this vapor stream up. Then we're taking steam here in a second heat exchanger, condensing steam out, and heating that fluid. This stream entering my flash vessel is being heated a second time. So now I come into the flash vessel. What's a flash drum's purpose in a flow sheet? The separator, firstly. What is the mechanism of separation? What's, what's it going to do? What is a flash drum? Yes, it uses the VLD to separate it, so the phase is going to go to the vapor on the phase and go to the Right, so it's using the mechanism of the vapor liquid equilibrium. The differences in vapor pressures between the components entering. So we've got various hydrocarbons coming in, methane, ether, butane, for example. It's using the differences in vapor liquid equilibrium, and some of those components, the heavier ones, will go to liquid, the lighter ones will go to vapor. Okay, so it's a splitter, as well as playing on the vapor liquid equilibrium differences to get that separation from the curve. So then my heavier streams is liquid now and then is being pumped out. So this pump here is pumping liquid out through that valve. The vapor phase, we can measure a pressure on it and it's leaving through that valve. Okay, so this is a very simple unit operation. It's essentially a flash drum for those of you that want a, a different context of it. It's like a single tray in a distillation column. It's doing the equivalent work of a single tray in a distillation column. Now, this diagram that we have up here, this is a flash drum, heat exchanger, heat exchanger. This is the level of detail we're looking for in the project. So when you're drawing up your, your flow diagrams, the diagram that's given in the PDF handout from Dr. Adams is a, just showing flash drum. But that's not what there is in the flow sheet in reality. There's much more to it. There's all these sensors. Flow sensors, temperature sensors, valves, and these need to be present in your, in your work that you submit. So, given that discussion now, take a look at this diagram, and let's say this was given to you. Would you build this process and start operating it? Okay, so here's the hint, no. But why? What is it there? What do you notice about that design? Take a minute and, to, and talk with the person around you to, to discuss some, some of the issues. Six layers, but we'll only focus on the first four in this uh, section of the course. 
We're going to look at the sorts of equipment we've put in place for those four layers, and we'll give some examples when we address each one of them. So let's take a look at those six layers, and we'll only focus on the first four, as I said. This is uh, one way of looking at it. It's called the onion diagram. And we have as our most basic form of safety is these simple control loops. So the basic process control system, this is all the stuff from the 3P course. Okay, that's why 3P is a, such an important prerequisite for this course. Okay, we really use that, that material very, very strongly here. So basic process control system, these are your PI loops, PID loops. And they're going to keep you in a region of operation as your first line of defense. We rely on those to automatically take care of minor deviations. We'll see that in a minute, illustrated in a time-based time domain. Next, we have alarms. So if the basic process control system cannot keep us in range, we then throw up an automatic alarm. Again, no human interaction required here yet. But the alarm will alert the person in the control room that something is wrong, some action needs to be taken. And then that person is responsible now for trying to fix the problem. So in a layer, the basic automatic control system cannot fix the problem. So we <coughs> call on a person to do so in this next second layer. Now, if that person is not paying attention or they're taking some action that is ineffective. The process we put in place next is the safety interlock system, or safety instrumented system. And this will automatically start or shut down certain equipment to try and achieve safe, safe operation. So beyond human control, this system kicks in and will turn off or turn on as required, depending on the context, equipment or valves to try and move the process to a safe operation point or shut down even. So this is very drastic. We don't want to ever use our safety interlock system at all. Right? <coughs> if we're moving to that level, we've got a serious problem at hand. And this arguably, whenever you have a safety interlock kick in, is something that should be investigated after the fact. Why did we get to this point where we needed this to take place. If that still doesn't work for us, then we may need to relieve the process. So we may need to relieve a built up pressure or some liquid is <coughs> accumulated and we need to get rid of it. So we call on the relief, and these are things like flares and containment units around our process to contain the, the liquid or vapor uh, phase. Or, uh, and then we ne next look at our containment section. So I, I mix those two up. The relief section, we look at relieving it, and we try to get rid of it safely. If we cannot relieve it in a safe manner, we then at least try to contain it. Okay, so if you walk um, through a refinery, you will often see concrete barriers around units. Okay, so especially those large containment vessels that you see. So you see like 12 of these circular vessels in a row. They're always surrounded by concrete barriers. Those concrete barriers are designed so that they will contain most, if not all, of the liquid that might spill from those units. Okay, so that's a containment vessel. We don't just allow this material to leak into the soil or into the environment around our plants. Containment vessel would also be the equivalent of that nuclear reactor that we saw earlier. We build a concrete shell and it's designed to be strong enough to retain any of the problems occurring inside it. And then lastly, if we cannot contain it and we, we do have a leak into the environment around us, we rely on outside people to come and assist us. And this is really something we never want to get to. In fact, anything from about here on is something we don't want to be happening on a regular basis at our site. Okay, so we're going to get another view of it, if you want to see it this way. Basic process control system is responsible for keeping us at set point. So, in the time domain, we have a certain a variable, let's call it temperature. 
as an example, and there's a set point that we wish to be operating around. That's our desired point of operation. And what we're willing to accept is deviations around the set point over time. So periodically we'll go above, below that set point. And we're quite okay with that. But we have to accept that because our process is not operating in a perfect environment where everything coming in is perfectly at steady state. Our process, um, let's say this temperature uh, is on a reactor, for example. So here's my, my pack bed reactor. I've got some feed coming in. It's leaving out here. And I can measure this temperature inside the reactor. So this feed coming in will be of variable flow rate. There will be variable amounts of impurities. Those deviations through time are totally normal. And we will see that temperature fluctuate as a result of that. And we may be using this flow rate, leaving that reactor, as one way to control the temperature. So if this is an exothermic reactor, I can control the residence time inside this reactor by opening and closing this valve. If I open it a bit more, my material flows out faster. It's got a shorter residence time in the reactor, less time to react. The temperature is going to go up or down for an exothermic reactor. If I open that valve, the temperature inside the reactor will go down. So open the valve, open the valve, more flow, flow goes up, flow goes up, the residence time in the reactor is shorter, residence time is shorter, less opportunity to generate heat of reaction, temperature will drop. Okay. So if we're operating too high, my temperature is too high, what do I do to my valve? Open the valve. Okay, temperature is too low. We'll close the valve. So simple, straightforward, three-p stuff with the combination of reactive design. Now, this is our normal operation. Let's say there's a level here. This is my alarm level, and for some reason, there's a high amount of impurity coming through here that's causing a side reaction, causing my temperature. <coughs> increase. So I'm operating at steady state and then I see this rise in temperature occurring. What do I do to my valve? So this temperature starts to go up. The automatic basic process control system, what will it do? Temperature is getting too high open this valve to try and release the material through the reactor faster to try and cool it down. But if I get to a point where this valve is 100% open, temperature just keeps going up. Okay, So we will get to a point where these units down here in the basic control system will fail. We don't have infinite capacity. So this alarm will go off. The alarm will alert the operators in the control room. There's a problem here on this reactor. Yes? What, what is the LDH? Okay, no, so we're, we're getting to that next. Okay, so alarm is going off in the control room. The operators can take some action on there. Okay, they can slow down the feed coming in and override that to, to try and bring us back to stable operation. Okay, so LAH here is a level high alarm. These are just different indicators. Uh, so it's not the same example being carried through along. But so an example might be that your level is exceeding and in a different in a different example it might be your level that's high and so you take some action. Okay, so the principle is that we get to our set, we have our set points, then we have our alarm level, and if the operators are not taking action, they're ignoring the alarm perhaps, or they're taking some action that is not appropriate, and we reach an even higher temperature now. This is a temperature that's very close to 
compromise the integrity of that reactor. So the materials of construction of that reactor will not be able to handle temperatures much higher than this. Or it might be that there's a catalyst in this packed bed, and if you go much higher than this temperature, you destroy your catalyst, which is $20 million. Right? So we don't want to suffer that economic loss because someone is not able to control the temperature, or because this lo lower level here fails. Okay, so we don't want to incur economic costs or safety issues due to that. So we have then our SIS level, or our high level alarm in this case. That may kick in, and it will be a, it will be a mechanism, we'll learn more about it, that will shut this process down without human intervention it will automatically bring the process to a safe point of operation. Okay. Very, very undesirable because you now basically have shut your plant down in an uncontrolled manner that's costly, you're not producing product, and then you have to bring it back up into production again, which may take several days. Okay. So we definitely don't want to be reaching this point. Almost never. Okay, now if we go beyond that level, there's, uh, there's maybe a, uh, gases in here that need to be relieved of pressure. We'll look at safety relief devices in a few classes from now. And then a look at flaring and containment. And that's where our focus will end. And we we'll be relying on outside people to come fix up our problems. So this gives you two views of this, the hierarchy. Here's the onion diagram, and here's the sort of a hierarchy in terms of the time domain of events occurring. The next key point is that when we look at these systems, we have to recognize that they're independent. Okay? What do we mean by independent here is that this layer <coughs> has absolutely no interaction with the one above it or the other two around it. So every one of these layers is independent of each other. That means that, for example, if the basic process control system fails, let's say there's a power outage and the basic process control system fails, these other three layers must still be able to operate. Okay? That's what independent means. That means that there's no interplay between these systems. The, the, the temperature sensor that you use here in the basic process control system cannot be the same temperature sensor that you use in the safety interlock system. Okay? So this is now a cost. This is why safety costs money, because we now have to have a redundant second temperature sensor for this layer so that we maintain that integrity of separation and that independence. So safety isn't cheap because of this redundancy. Okay? And we have to have that independence so that each one of these layers works as required. Now, when you, I don't know if Dr. Schwartz uh, teaches this in 3P, but when you're looking at process control loops and process control systems, we design them to achieve seven objectives simultaneously. Safe operation, they protect the environment and they protect our equipment. So we don't want to ruin that catalyst in my reactor. I don't want to mess up the people's backyards around me, and I want to keep my people in my process safe. Those are the three topics we're focusing on here. But we also design them, and this is usually the focus that you see when we teach 3P, the process control courses, that we design those loops so that we get smooth operation. Right? So you recall, you tune your control loops so you get smooth trajectories that go to set point really quickly. Okay, so if you get to set point really quickly, that means that you're getting good quality product. If you can get to set point quickly with good quality product, you're going to make profit. Okay, so when we look at 3P, we're looking at these primarily, but we also have to recognize that those loops are doing much more than that. They're solving those first three. And then this is an area of interest. It's where we monitor the process and diagnose it. So any problems with the process in the future, we go look back at those temperature data and try to figure out what went wrong. Okay, so we don't teach that here in the undergraduate level, um, but that is an important part of the process. OK, so let's take a look at, at what our basic process control system should be doing for us. And we're going to look at an example where you're going to do this yourself. 
the rule of thumb is always control your unstable variables. What's an unstable variable? What would be an example of how the, it would look if it's unstable? So you've learned about stable and unstable or stability in, in 3P and stable processes in 3E, the modeling course. So what do we mean by something that's unstable? So here we're operating in time. This is the time dimension here horizontally. Everything in the rest of this course is going to be this way. So we're operating here steady state. <coughs> This is a variable that's potentially unstable. What happens if at this point it starts to go unstable? What do we mean by that? It oscillates. It oscillates. Overshoots. Sarah shaking her head. Anyone? What do the mathematicians say when something's unstable? It diverges. It diverges. It just goes up to infinity. It goes down to minus infinity. Okay, so we don't have that. Before we get to plus infinity, we We've got bigger problems on our hands. So unstable variable is something that will just keep rising without bound. Okay, we, we know that this is going to cause a problem at some point along this, this time. So that's an unstable variable. A stable variable would be something that kind of takes a first order type of trajectory and settles out at some new value. So if something changes in my process, for example, I, I, sh I close a valve, so it's open, say, at 25%, and I close it down to 0% on this valve. That, that, that ver the, the corresponding result from that change is such that I get this process settling out at some new value. An unstable variable is one which if possible, we'll just keep going up and up, or down and down and down. So first rule of thumb is always control the unstable variable. That's rule one. Second rule is always control, and when we say this always control, by that we mean put on a PI loop or a PID loop. So, and that's a lot. Right, so saying always control means, it means select your manipulated variable, select your controlled variable, and select your control algorithm. So always control, those two words mean a lot of things. You have to do a lot of work for those two words. Select your manipulated variable, your controlled variable, and put your control system, i.e. your control algorithm in place. So always do that for unstable variables. Always do that for variables which might be, which are stable, but change very quickly. So these are variables that, without you even knowing it, will quickly change to a new value. They're stable, but this rise to some new value can almost be instantaneous. This might be just a few seconds. Okay, so this is called a quick, quick variable. Far faster than anyone sitting in the control room can watch. They don't have, they're watching two, three hundred variables and, and plots on their screens. There's no way that they can keep track of every single one's change. So a quick variable is something that can quickly move to a new point. It's still stable, but it may go to an unsafe position. What's an example of something like that? What are variables that you know of that can change quite quickly in the process? pH in, in certain uh, treatment processes that's not buffered it can easily change quickly. Yeah. Temperature. Temperature on what type of units? Yeah. On a reactor, temperature can change pretty quickly. Yeah, for sure. Concentration, sometimes. In certain instances, if uh, on, on that same reactor, concentration might change fairly rapidly, for sure. Another one is pressure. Pressure is one that very quickly can go high and low. Okay, so, so when we say always control these, we need to find manipulated variables to counteract that change. 
we will control those variables that change very slowly. So corrosion or catalyst fouling. These are things that take months or years on a process. Those we don't need to control. But those we just keep track of and we monitor periodically. Okay, so let's take a look at that back in the context of this example. Which, what's, what's unsafe about this process? So first answer that. And then secondly, what would you control? <clears throat> Take two, three minutes to answer those. Potentially unsafe conditions exist in the flash drive if it's put in place and operated as shown here. What things could go wrong? So it's very strongly related to this next question because if it's going to go wrong, we're going to control it. Right, so basically, we're answering the second question as well. What what would you control in this flow sheet? Right, pressure. Uh, Pressure in the flash drum, why? Uh, because if it became too high, you could rupture. Okay, okay so if pressure became too high, you could, you could rupture that drum. So that's an unsafe condition. So that's an example of a variable changing very quickly on you. Is it stable or unstable?
put it for the delivery rate. So, you know. so we're going to change our vapor liquid equilibrium. So we're going to send more vapor than we would otherwise, and then that will cause that pressure to go up again. Anything else? The level and the flash flash drum. Is that stable or unstable? <coughs> Okay, it's, there's a thought that it's stable, it's easy to control with the flows. What if this valve is closed? Then it's going to go up. It's just going to go up without bound. So level is an unstable variable. Almost always you can be sure that when you've got a closed container and valves on the, on the exit for, for the liquid phase, it's almost guaranteed to be an unstable variable. Okay, so if I close this valve and I keep sending material in, yeah, it's going to flash, it's going to form a liquid phase, and that liquid phase is going to rise, and we're just going to repeat BP Texas City. Yeah. But can we control the level from the, from the two valves we have and the inlet valve as well? How does how it become right. steady? OK. Can we control level from this inlet valve? A little bit, yes. Not exactly, but a bit. Yeah, so if this is closed, then you, you cannot control that. So what do we use to control that? So control is always select your manipulated variable and your control variable. So we want to control level, so we solve that problem. What do we manipulate to change level? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five valves to choose from. Which do we pick? Okay. So level is most suitably controlled with this valve leaving here. We have a pump there, but the pump is on. Pump it. Just is going. Okay, so this valve is the most suitable valve to control level here. This pump is this pump is essentially setting the pressure over here and the pressure downstream is whatever it is. So if this valve opens and closes, it's going to manipulate that. Yeah. So if you can you can go back. Yes. Sorry. After the pump, what is the A1? A1. A1 is the uh, composition sensor. Yeah. Purity. So if you do the, the mass balance on that on that unit, so think back to 3P and 3E with Tom Adams. Always you derive these differential equations for, for a system. So cross-sectional area of the flash vessel, dl by dt, the level in this flash drum. So we consider that L. So rate of change of L with time. So that's my accumulation. Accumulation. is in minus out. So what flow is coming in? Well, we've got material coming in here in my flash, and it's flashing to both liquid and vapor phase. So there's my entry point into the vessel. That entry point flashes. We've got some flow of vapor going up. Okay, we don't know what that number is necessarily without doing the vapor-liquid equilibrium calculations. There's some flow of vapor going up and some flow of liquid dropping out into the bottom of the flash, flash drum. So flow in is equal to FL minus out is equal to <coughs> F5. Okay, so that's my, my model for that unit. So if FL is zero, I get no flow in, and F5 is open, I've got some flow leaving, Level is just going to drop and drop and drop and drop until I drain that flash vessel and then I'm pumping on an empty stream over here and I'm going to ruin my pump. So we don't want that happening. If F5 is shut down, so I close that valve, F5 is now zero, and I'm feeding material into my flash vessel, it's flashing and I'm forming vapor liquid, that vessel is just going to go up and up and up. And then we're going to start putting liquid into that stream. And as I said before, that's exactly what happened at BP Texas City. We saw that 
and the tutorial on Monday. And that's disastrous as well. So a level must be controlled with in lower bounds and upper bounds here in this particular example. And we're going to do that by setting this loop here. So, so manipulate that valve position by adjusting level, and then we call this LC1. So that becomes my level controller 1 by manipulating valve V4. And so that solves that unstable variable. Any other variables on this column that we must control? We said pressure earlier, right? So five valves, we've used one up now for this. So we've got four valves left. Which valve do we use to control pressure? V5. Anything else that we could use or that you might have considered using? Why not V3? Okay, presumably V3 is going to be a bit more liquid than gas. That might be one reason. V3 is also our throughput for the process. Right? So we tend not to select valves that are going to manipulate our production levels. And so we don't want to control pressure by varying our production level. Right? We would rather control pressure by some other mechanism and keep our production constant as far as possible. So those, these, are, these are things that you're sitting here and you're like, oh my god, where, did, where was I supposed to learn this stuff, right? Well, we learn it from these sorts of case studies and experience. So when we're choosing our valve selection, we try not to manipulate valves that are going to throttle and change production levels. We want to keep those constant. So let's select the 5 then to control pressure. Okay. So what direction is that going to take? If I open V5, What's going to happen to F4? So here's time. We're operating at steady state. Here's F4's current flow level. Here's my, my pressure at steady state. F4, if I, well, let's say if I close it by, by some amount. I'm closing F, the valve, V5, so F4 drops. Pressure increase. increase. So pressure P1 at that time. Now, unstable or stable variable? Okay. This is this is when you close the valve. Yeah. So I'm closing V5. So F4 drops. Yeah. So let's do this step. So close V5 by some percentage. P1 going to just keep rising, or is it going to steady out at some new value? Okay, so if it's steady out at some new value, okay, so there's your answer here, it's actually a stable variable. So P1 will steady out at some new value. that is the pressure for the safety rating on that vessel. So we cannot exceed that pressure because then we, that vessel explodes. Okay, so we need to make sure that this valve and that flow manipulation has the capability to bring this pressure back to control before exceeding that safety level. Otherwise, if we exceed the safety level, we're going to kick in our safety alarm systems. Okay. So, these are the sorts of questions we need to have in mind. Do we have the capacity on this uh, manipulated variable to avoid unsafe operation? And if we cannot avoid this high level of pressure, our next step is going to then be to add relief valve onto that flash drum so that if we cannot get our pressure below limits, at least we can send it to a relief and flare it off. So these are the sorts of thinking you have in mind. So this is so, it looks messy, right? The flash drum, just that you, you look at it on a flow sheet from Dr. Adams and you see flash and then this happening, right? But it's not just that, it's actually all of this and 
all these loops and thought that goes into it. Okay, so this is the sort of exploratory work you're going to have to do on your flow sheets for the project. Yes, would you have any questions? Okay, I don't understand why you're using flows by the airport, for example, or up. So if we close B5, should F4 go up or down? It's, this is the flow of the vapor stream. So this is in, uh, say, meters cube per second, for example. So if I close the valve, that flow rate of the vapor will be slower, and so I get less of the volumetric flow. Doesn't the valve some people out? So if I close the valve, let's say the valve is currently at 50% open, and I go to 20% open. But we like to tap it on, we just close it, and the flow rate coming out of the valve drops off. So this is, whether it's liquid or gas, same principle holds. It will slow down that flow. And I think you might be getting confused that it's vapor phase versus liquid phase. It's still the same principle would apply that the, the flow rate, F, F here refers to flow, say, meters cubed per second or some volume at a time. Um, maybe because I didn't specify the unit. So that flow would decrease and the pressure in the vessel would go up. Okay. So we've paired up our fast variable. It's stable, but it's fast moving. And we've paired up our liquid level, which is unstable in that, in that vessel. Okay. In the next uh, few classes, we'll see why these heat exchanger valves are seemingly SLI and ask why is this valve here on this side of the heat exchanger and not on the steam side? It's, a, it's still effective and actually it's a, it's a better choice to have it here than it is to have it there. We'll see that coming up. So there's all sorts of other, we can, we can pair up this, this flow over here with one of these temperatures. So if I'm manipulating, if I'm requiring this temperature to be at a certain level in order to achieve the desired vapor liquid equilibrium, I can pair up that flow rate with this temperature. So there's, there's, there's several other possibilities to control the secondary objectives. We're looking at just a primary objective now for safety. So come back to this, um, come back to this slide over here. We had said, let's look at safety and protecting our equipment and protecting the environment. That's what we're focusing on now. And those are the two control loops we'll uh, pair up to achieve those two objectives. Okay, here's one final, yes. In the previous one, yeah, so we'll, we'll look at that option here because this valve here is going to manipulate, uh, okay, I'm gonna, without going, because that's a long discussion to, to have. This valve here is here for a safety reason, you could, given the, the nature of this heat exchange. So we'll talk about that, this difference versus this difference later on. But that's a good point. So two, three classes from now, we'll answer your question. One final one for you to think about is, let's consider this new example. Here's a reactor, exothermic reaction taking place. And we say, well, okay, I can, manipulate the temperature in this reactor, so to prevent temperature runaway, by injecting cold feed into the feed point of the reactor. So this outlet temperature over here, I don't want this to exceed a certain upper bound. So when this temperature is too high, I open this valve, send a bit more cold feed in to the reactor to cool it down. What if that temperature sensor fails? So these temperature sensors, there's two wires in there, and they're welded together. And after a point in time, this, this reactor is vibrating, there's movement around the system, and after 10, 12 years of operation, those wires are vibrating, and then one day they split apart. So instead of reading 220 degrees Celsius, it reads zero degrees Celsius. What's going to happen? All feed will stop, what's going to happen to the temperature? It's going to go rise. And you're setting up the cycle, and you've got to have problems. So what can we do? In your controller, you can put it if like, the temperature doesn't change for a specific amount of time. Say like 30 seconds, it's exactly the same. Shut everything down. 
Okay, so you can, but that's, that's aggressive. <laughs> Just shut everything out. Well, so if the temperature is like not moving at all. No temperature movement at all. Yeah. Well, instead of shutting down, just snap your cold feed valve because you're still at least operating. Snap your cold feed valve open based on. So, like, what other? Yeah. Or have a fixed range that would that would the the delivery normally stays in. If it goes below that, I mean then. Again, otherwise just keep on working. Okay, so make sure there's temperatures within a certain range, if not take some action. So we've got three proposals here. Let's take a look at this example next class and just continue focusing.